Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, distinguished guests, the European research area is a fact. And overcoming borders through cooperation is one of its core values. When the world's brightest minds work together, able to choose their research topics and partners as freely as possible, excellent knowledge-driven research transcends national borders by its very nature. And it does so all the more effectively, the more favorable the framework conditions are. For this reason, the DFG is striving for a European research area, ERA for short, in which collaborations between researchers in Germany and their partners in Europe can be funded as efficiently and as flexibly as possible. Our new Europe strategy sets out 10 goals with the expansion of bilateral and multilateral cooperation in the era as a key element. I'm therefore delighted that our three distinguished panelists will be joining us in a moment to discuss aspects of this cooperation. From the DFG's perspective, the era is determined by three factors. Strong national research systems, multilateral cooperation and EU funding programs. It is the effective and diversified interaction of these three factors that ensures a highly innovative and globally competitive era. The DFG is committed to advancing the era by pursuing three principles. Firstly, to promote knowledge-driven research of the highest quality in a fair and science-led competition. Secondly, to strategically support emerging fields of research where necessary. And thirdly, to shape the best possible framework conditions. We seek to contribute to a strong and dynamic era in which researchers can cooperate with partners in Europe at any time and on any topic, depending on their research interests. One key factor for a competitive era is the variety of its closely interlinked, highly effective and autonomous national research and funding systems. And these are particularly successful when they coexist with the EU framework programs. Not only are the national funding organizations in close contact with their scientific communities, enabling them to respond directly to the needs of knowledge-driven research, the distinct national systems of research and funding also give rise to highly versatile research that we need to consolidate and promote. Close cooperation strengthens the individual countries involved particularly widening countries, and thereby Europe as a whole. Indeed, the era's great institutional variety provides a fertile environment for truly wide-ranging gains in knowledge made in Europe. The second factor that characterizes the era is bilateral and multilateral cooperation. This is what enables the DFG, together with its partner organizations, to provide tailor-made cross-border funding opportunities that meet the needs of the researchers. The crucial importance of such funding schemes is demonstrated by the high level of demand among researchers for easily accessible bilateral funding programs. For this reason, the DFG's funding portfolio provides numerous opportunities for cooperation with European partners across disciplines and topics at any time. With the aim of expanding these funding opportunities in line with demand in the scientific community, we have recently concluded several bilateral memoranda of understanding with partner organizations in Israel, in Norway, 
in Switzerland and the United Kingdom, as well, of course, as also in Asia and the Americas. The most prominent example of bilateral and trilateral cooperation is certainly the very successful WEAVE initiative. This currently enables researchers to submit joint proposals with one or two European partners at any time and on any topic, which they uh, then are handled by one of the partner organizations. This requires trust in each other and in the quality of the respective processes. The DFG is open to further expanding the WEAVE initiative wherever quality allows, as it brings us closer to our common goal in Europe to enable borderless cooperation. The DFG, moreover, strives for an era that offers its broad institutional spectrum the world's best framework conditions for research. Yet the way in which research can be conducted depends not only on funding structures, but also on the legal and scientific framework conditions. This is why we are very grateful, both to national and European policy makers, for their willingness to engage in constant, trusting dialogue and for their openness towards the efforts of scientific communities and funding organizations in shaping an era that is well suited to pioneering cutting-edge research. To shape the framework conditions for research cooperation in Europe, we actively contribute to Science Europe and support initiatives such as the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment and the European Open Science Cloud. We are also increasingly contributing to EU legislative processes relevant to research, such as animal welfare or the use of new breeding methods. Jointly developing coherent standards, criteria and procedures enables us to facilitate knowledge-driven research of the highest quality within the era. Nowadays, these framework conditions definitely include research security and exercising particular caution when considering cooperation with certain partners. Unfortunately, I would like to say. Like many partner organizations, the DFG has issued guidelines on how to de-risk research cooperation, providing guidance, providing guidance and support for researchers and reviewers. If we agree on common value-based guidelines founded on the principle of responsible openness, and if we harness science diplomacy to build bridges and open windows of opportunity, the benefits of cooperation will outweigh the risks for research and society, even in a changing and a challenging geopolitical landscape. Complementing strong national research systems and multilateral cooperation in Europe, the European funding programs, notably the EU framework programs, are the third factors, factor that determine the era. The DFG is particularly dedicated to ensuring that the interests of the scientific community are adequately reflected in these programs, namely the objective of strengthening independent research of the highest quality. In the negotiations for the upcoming EU framework program, the DFG is therefore advocating better opportunities for additional funding of basic research collaborations. There is a particular need for transnational research consortia on self-chosen topics and for EU co-funding of transnational calls of national research funding organizations to new instruments that would further facilitate the free movement of researchers, of knowledge and innovation across Europe. So the interplay of these three aforementioned factors 
results in a unique, I would like to say, wealth of institutions and fields of research. In this European research area, researchers from the most diverse cultural and social backgrounds can freely pursue their scientific curiosity, conducting outstanding basic research in close cooperation with international partners. The rich variety of their findings and innovations is our capital for the future and vital to the global success of cutting-edge research, both made in Germany and pursued jointly in Europe. Adequately promoting this variety requires a broad range of funding programs, both at national and multilateral level throughout Europe and complemented by the EU framework programs. Whether at European or global level, the basis for fruitful multilateral research funding is provided by strong national research systems with independent research institutions and funding organizations. So, moving now on to our panel discussion, please join me again in welcoming our moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Becker, um, for this very clear perspective on how the DFG sees European cooperation in the future and the future of ERA. Um, I also found it interesting that you reminded us uh, to enable borderless cooperation is really one of the key common goals we all have in Europe. I think that's, we have to keep that in mind always. Um, we are now really looking forward to um, welcome the other guests. I would ask you to take the seat to the right. And this gives me the opportunity to introduce the other three panelists uh, whose name we already mentioned. Please uh, join us up here on the stage, Professor Christoph Joszwiak from Poland. Please come up here and take the seat next. <laughs> Professor Dame Ottolin Leiser, we have the middle seat for you. Please join us here. And uh, Professor Walter Rosenthal, please come up here as well. And as soon as we are all seated, I will say a couple of words to each of you, of course. Grzysztof Joszwiak um, is the director of the National Science Center in Poland. Um, MCN is the abbreviation. He's a chemist by training, made his PhD in Lublin in Poland. Um, at the Medical University, where he today is a professor at the Faculty of Pharmacy. Um, the National Science Center in Poland was established in 2011. Uh, it's Poland's major funding agency for basic research, if I'm right. Budget of around 300 million euros per year, more or less. Correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, it already has many joint initiatives with DFG, and we'll uh, come to some of those later. Welcome, Professor Joszwiak. It's great to have you here. Professor Dame Ottolin Leiser is the chief exec executive of UKRI, which is UK Research and Innovation. Um, she's made a PhD in genetics in 1990, University of Cambridge. She became professor for plant development at Sainsbury Lab at the very same university in 2011, and she's now the director of the Sainsbury Lab there. In 2000, Not corrections are allowed. Not since I've been doing this job. Okay, okay, you were. <laughs> But this one is right and definitely correct. Uh, 2017, she was knighted and became Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire for her services to science and society. And uh, UK Research and Innovation, the organization she's uh, Chief Executive Officer, is an umbrella organization of all the nine British research councils, basically. Um, uh, it describes itself in its uh, annual report as the engine for the UK as a powerhouse for research and innovation. I think that's, that's a decent statement. Annual budget, roughly 9 billion euros, um, 3.5 for basic research, which is more or less on par with what the DFG has. Um, um, also, the UKRI has many joint initiatives with the DFG already. Welcome. Professor Dave Otterlin Lies, it's great to have you here and we're curious to what you have.
Walter Rosenthal is the president of the German Rectors Conference, uh, HRK in German, which represents the uh, interests of basically all the German universities and gives them one voice. He's a medical doctor by training who then turned to pharmacy, quite uh, pharmacology, uh, more correctly. Big difference. Uh, big difference. <laughs> pharmacology, I apologize, uh, because uh, very successfully he turned well. to pharmacology. He was, among others, director of the Leibniz Institute for Molecular Pharmacology in Berlin. He was chair of the board and scientific director of the Max Delbrück Center in Berlin. He was uh, president of the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena from 2014 to 2023. And the German Rectors Conference, he's now presiding, supports many German universities in many ways in their efforts to become even more international. It's great to have you here, Professor Rosenthal. <laughs> Professor Juzviak, the first question goes to you. Um, during the last decades, um, Poland's National Science Center has really considerably extended its ties to international partners especially also to Germany um, in the framework of the bilateral cooperation within the WEAVE initiative, mm -hmm. we've already heard of. Um, WEAVE enables very simple cooperation um, with partners from up to three European countries and is aimed in reducing bureaucracy, which um, Staatsminister Professor Plume should be should something he would appreciate probably. So given all this experience in cooperation projects within European research uh, frameworks. What are the benefits you see for bi- and multilateral research cooperations for different actors, especially in Poland? If we look at universities, research organizations, um, what are the benefits and how do you in Poland intend to further push international cooperation in the future? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, indeed. Uh... National Science Center is uh, an organization involved in plenty of different initiatives, mm -hmm. bilateral, multilateral. Uh, they are, we are very happy to develop them and we really can see growing interest of uh, Polish scientists, scientists working in Poland uh, to be involved in those initiatives and to found the research in a uh, international co collaboration and cooperation uh, manner. So we can really see, first of all, we can really see the uh, growing number of researchers, growing number of consortia which are um, involved in this, which is obviously very important uh, from the point of view of developing the excellence of science and developing the uh, open research which is performed on a uh, um, excellent level on the uh, most interesting, broad and uh, complete topics. So indeed, we are partner in uh, Weave. We have, uh, I think, a growing partner in uh, this Weave initiative. We really can see a, a growing number of uh, uh, researchers who are involved in proposals, who are involved in uh, winning the grants, and very frequently they are involved as uh, leaders of uh, international consortia to, to run uh, these uh, projects. Uh, I think I can uh, uh, say something from the point of view of uh, uh, or from the Polish perspective, which is a perspective of the so-called widening country. So indeed, we uh, started the research, running research in a really open and international uh, manner uh, not so long ago, which is indeed a challenge at the very beginning, but soon as as soon as we open the opportunity for the researchers to uh, apply and to run projects in the uh, and to fund projects in the international uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, systems, we could uh, very quickly see the uh, that lot of the researchers 
get involved into that. We are we have a growing number of really uh, 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 research groups which are internationally uh, recognized, internationally uh, cooperative and internationally uh, competitive. And uh, that's, uh, if I can recall to what uh, Professor Becker said, this is indeed what the best what we can do. We, uh, our job is to uh, develop the strong national research system to allow scientists and to encourage scientists to uh, be involved in the international uh, collaboration, international projects, and uh, to be just, you know, a, a part of a worldwide uh, running science. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, what you said is we come to back, back to that later. So cooperation is like, like fueling excellence, basically, right? That's mm -hmm. the experience from Poland. That's maybe yes. something we come back later a little bit uh, to. I'd uh, like to first uh, hand over to Professor Dame Ottolin Leiser. Um, since January 2024, the UK is finally back, back in Horizon Europe, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as an associate <laughs> member of the Framework Programme, so uh, the European Union's 95 billion Framework Programme, which is a big program for research and innovation. Uh, I know from uh, from interviews I've made with people in Great Britain that many researchers were longing for this moment for quite a while uh, because it gives them now much, much easier access to money from Brussels again. What are the main reasons for the reassociation from your point of view so that it happened now? <laughs> and which implications does it actually have for um, UKRI's by and multilateral uh, cooperation schemes? Thank you. I, I think I'm going to um, start zooming out massively, which is perhaps a slight stretch of your question, but I think it's important. I, we're living in a very difficult time. Um, globally, there are a lot of challenges, climate change, we've just been through an economic crisis and then a pandemic. And that kind of anxiety and the inequalities that have gone with that, I think have allowed um, people who want to, to drive division and a lot of what we're seeing in within nations between nations globally is the manifestation of that polarized division which is really a challenge for all of us i think research and innovation are extraordinarily powerful in tackling that they're fundamentally about hope they're about the ability if we work together to address these challenges in all kinds of ways. And they are about agency. They are about taking people out of a position where they feel both um, helpless, but also um, disempowered and giving people, if we work together, that power to tackle these kinds of challenges. That, that's a very kind of grandiose statement, but it's also something I believe very passionately and actually I think is demonstrably true. So I think research and innovation are a key tool in the world as we tackle the challenges that we're facing together. And in that context, of course, international collaboration in research and innovation is, is a critical part, precisely transcending all of those borders, all of those boundaries that are currently separating us and keeping us apart. So as well as the, the sort of bottom-up drive where individual researchers are striving for excellence, want to proceed as quickly as they can to collaborate with the best people in the world, to access the best equipment. All of that bottom-up drive is entirely concordant with the extraordinary opportunity to use all of that creativity to reshape our world for the better and to build that more um, collaborative world with social cohesion at the core. And that's, I think, um, our opportunity. And as funding agencies, we kind of sit in between those things. We sit in between the political drivers for supporting research and innovation that are, of course, about um, economic growth and um, uh, excellence in public services and providing prosperity to nations, but also about tackling global challenges that we need to work together to do. So all of that. And then on the other side, the research community 
wonderful people motivated by the excitement of their field, wanting to discover new things, wanting that to be useful in the world in, in, a, in an integrated way. So that's our chance. And I think the Horizon Europe program and those framework programs in general are fantastic example of, of the combination of those things, bringing together countries, bringing together extraordinary talent from across Europe to create easy opportunities to work together to solve those kinds of problems. So of course, it's rather important, I think, for the UK um, to be part of that, to be able to contribute. And I'm incredibly excited that we have finally got over the hurdle of, of being able to um, to associate, and I'm also uh, really pleased that UKRI has been able to um, help that process. So the UK government throughout actually has provided a, a guarantee stream of funding so that uh, researchers applying to Horizon Europe, whilst we were not associated, were still able to apply, and were they successful, there was an alternative funding source that we channeled through to support that. So I hope that that's allowed it, the momentum, uh, although undoubtedly slowed by the hiatus um, to be rapidly um, rebuilt so that we can be a really fully, fully participating member. It's very exciting. Thank you very much. We'll dig a little deeper in a couple of minutes um, how uh, future cooperation schemes could, could, uh, could look like. Um, let's shift to Professor Rosenthal. Um, Professor Rosenthal, in Germany, we've seen a very huge tendency towards internationalization. If you look at universities uh, within the last 10 to 15 years, I've read that we've, we've currently around 370,000 foreign students, students from abroad at German universities. So um, at universities, they already amount to 15% of all the students, mm -hmm. which is not as good as in Great Britain, of course, but well, um, try to get up. Uh, we, we're even uh, among the top four host countries. Meanwhile, um, I think directly after Great Britain now, um, for foreign students to come and um, get their ed education, basically. So obviously, things have been moving quite a bit. What role does the German Rectors Conference, whose president you are, play in bringing all this about? So what activities are you pursuing with respect to Europe and how do you support universities to become even more international in the future in Germany? Well, um, I think that science is in a traditional situation. You mentioned it today, the scientific community, and that's why we need um, the international co collaboration basically on, on all levels. And um, well, well, the HIK is, um, supports internationalization, of course, but I would clearly state that it's at the level of the individual institution, the individual university. And that's where international, international research, international teaching and so on is um, clearly promoted and we as HRK try to support it. I would like to emphasize that the European framework is very important for our universities and I think for the entire scientific community. And the important point is that um, the European area represents a shared space for our core values, academic freedom, institutional autonomy, and liberal democracy. And you know that they are not undisputed today. So I, I think it's very important that we have this European uh, framework because of these uh, challenges. And I think that the importance of the cooperation across Europe and beyond cannot be overstated. And the university and the German university, but also the other um, non-university institutions, they are informed by these uh, values. They are based on these values. The idea of a free and democratic Europe is one of the cornerstones on which our national science system rests. And it's safe to say that without this large, larger European frame, science and research in Germany would look different and would be worse um, off. The framework program for research also drives um, internationalization of German universities. They transform, uh, it transforms them into true European institutions, and on a different level, it also serves as an element for quality assurance. Academic cooperation across Europe is its many manifold forms, from re recently founded European University Alliance to long-established student exchange programs, which you mentioned, and from shared large-scale research infrastructure to single EU research projects, brings the concept of Europe to our universities here in Germany. And conversely, 
by participating in these programs, our universities also actively shape Europe and bring their own values and ideas to the larger European table. On a more worldly level, Europe has become an important source of third party funding for our universities. The figure was mentioned this morning, I think, that 10% of the third party funding at universities is European money. So it's very important and the universities simply could not live without it. Major funding agencies, the DFG of course, and also the BMBF, we saw the figures this morning too, 30%, around about 30% each um, institution. And I think that this European funding is also important for the prestige and the international visibility of our universities. I would like to mention briefly the European Research Council. It has become an important benchmark for cutting at its research. Around two-thirds of the ERC grants awarded to Germany over the past 10 years have gone to outstanding researchers at universities. It's of crucial importance to HRK and its member institutions that ERC remains the institution that prioritizes the generation of new knowledge in an open topic and excellent-based manner. Only this approach ensures that Europe will continue to lead in global innovation by exploring original ideas and setting new research trends. And finally, I strongly believe that it's imperative to safeguard the principles of excellence as the core criterion for funding decisions in European research programs. Only this principle ensures that funding is allocated to the most promising and high quality research projects, thereby enabling and fostering an environment of competitiveness and innovation which allows European research to thrive. Securing excellence and competitiveness in the European research area is in turn also the basis for ensuring that European science remains an attractive partner for scientific cooperation on a global scale. Thank you very much, Professor Rosenthal. Um, I think for the rest of this discussion, we'll skip the larger European part a little bit and look at the bilateral and multilateral corporations. Um, although ERC, without any doubt, is a very, very genius um, European invention, I think so. Uh, we, we all will all agree on that. Um, but I would like to come back to Professor Pecker because you were mentioning in your talk. So, in addition to the European uh, framework programs and, and all the things which are derived from that, like ERC, um, it's really important that we have these strong national innovation systems and we have strong and, and very intricate ties between those. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how DFG is approaching this? Because I've realized when preparing for this event that there's a whole bunch of different things already up and running. Many people are maybe not even familiar with. So could you tell us a bit more about what is your vision about yeah. this uh, bi- and multi corporations? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to say when, when the DFG enters or thinks about entering a bio-multilateral um, collaboration, the, the guiding principle or maybe the guiding star, so to say, is really the, the research interest of the scientists themselves. So if there is the demand from the scientific community and there are people, you know, standing up and saying, you know, we want to collaborate with this and that country maybe on this or that topic, this is something the DFG, of course, would, would um, react um, to. And then, um, when we get into contact with other countries, other organizations, we always have to take into account that the framework conditions that have been mentioned uh, previously, they can uh, considerably um, dif differ between different countries. So what we usually do is then sit together and compare the framework conditions in the different countries and then see how we can best match them, how we can bring them together. And then I would like to say the first level often is um, a thematic call uh, in a certain scientific area, you know, kind of explorative call on, on a certain topic um, to see how great the interest is and how the procedures actually, uh, actually work. Uh, the next level would then maybe be an open call which of course the DFG favors very much and there are some countries and also governments that have to be convinced that this is something good to do um, and maybe even standing open calls and the yeah, probably highest um, level are then lead agency procedures such in WEAVE 
um, which make the procedure of collaboration and also research funding much more easy, but also involve a lot of trust uh, also, I mean, in the quality of what the, what the mm -hmm. partners um, do. And next to, next to these aspects, of course, we also have, um, I would like to say, individual collaborations with each country, like with UK, UKRI, and, and um, Ottoline, of course. We have wonderful colleagues there. We have lo a long-standing tradition, I would like to say, a couple of hundred years of collaboration in research between UK and Germany, of course. And this is something we never want to lose, so we are so happy that we have these fantastic colleagues again in the European um, research area. Ottoline and my, myself just about a year ago signed um, an agreement on data sharing, um, which, uh, which uh, now can be used by all the councils uh, of UKRI and which will make it much more easy also, you know, to get the other uh, contracts and collaborations um, running. And um, uh, Ottoline, Leiser and myself, it, it has been mentioned before, are also very active together in, um, in bodies such as Science Europe um, or also the Global Research Council where we try to, I would like to say, fight together for yeah. the Ad same yeah. rights and the same ideas. So it's fantastic to have. So these are ad advo advocacy groups where researchers um, have uh, their, their, um, yeah. their interests and uh, pursue them publicly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and, and maybe just to add that, so, so with our wonderful colleagues from Poland, of course, also there is a great tradition of cooperation and great trust. Um, and um, here there are, I mean, several organizations, um, of course, um, NCN, but also FNP and also the mm -hmm. Academy. And we all collaborate together. We have joint funding programs. Um, we award the Copernicus Prize together. Mm -hmm. And we um, also have um, the Polish-German science meeting where our colleagues just two weeks uh, ago invited us to Warsaw and uh, we all met there to, to collaborate. So, and, and this is quite, you know, individual um, than uh, these, these relationships. I'd like to pass the, the question, uh, ask the question to all of you. So could the, the WEAVE initiative and this lead agency principle could that, if we look a little bit in the future, be sort of like as a template for future, for many more future <laughs> corporations within Europe? So, because obviously it was very difficult to get to that point because different agencies had to streamline their procedures and agree on uh, mechanisms, criteria, uh, and many things. So it was complicated, but um, was it worth it? And do you see it as a template? What would you say, Professor Joschwiak? Yes. <laughs> That's good. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, that's uh, indeed true. Uh, indeed, many different organizations, they have, uh, you know, some different frameworks and uh, details. Yeah. However, uh, working in uh, this type of format, we are more working also on a conformity, on the, you know, having those uh, regulations as similar as possible, which is also very, uh, very important uh, Part, we really benefited a lot from cooperation with uh, different organizations from uh, different countries. And uh, we also see a lot of uh, benefits from applying this uh, lead agency's procedures in WEAVE and in other uh, programs. So uh, they, we consider them uh, very effective and we would like to apply them also to some other multilateral and bilateral programs what we have at the moment. Uh, and they are not working on the uh, uh, lead agencies procedures uh, pro framework yet. What about UKRA? Um... Professor Leiser, are you also thinking of it? I think there are already some corporations in the same context. Could you think of making this become bigger or do you have other preferences concerning so, Yeah, We have a, a wide range of um, instruments for international collaboration and I think this issue of diversity is actually quite important because there are different 
reasons for international collaborations at different times with different partners and ensuring you have the, the, the range of tools you need to support those is key. So, um, for example, we have the opportunity or a kind of embedded mechanism now right across the organisation whereby any um, uh, applicant for a grant can bring on board uh, a colleague from a another country uh, as part of that mm -hmm. and um, up to 30% of the funding can go directly to the person mm -hmm. in the other country. So that's perhaps the lowest yep. effort way to build a collaboration with somebody in another country. Mm -hmm. And that, that tool is available to, to the various funding parts of the organisation when they want to use it. And then we have lead agency arrangements and um, MOUs and a whole variety of things to allow us to build mm -hmm. the bilateral and trilateral partnerships that we want to, and then actually, as I said at, at, at the beginning, because there is a, a straightforward political dimension to um, international science collaboration as part of the kind of wider diplomatic um, agenda, we also administer um, funds that are given to us directly by um, government to build collaborations with particular partners. And so again, you wind up with this kind of layered, bottom-up, top-down mm -hmm. set of tools that help you yeah, to navigate the landscape and hopefully drive both the best science we can, but also the best um, uh, collaboration and the best taking down of those borders that we're also mm -hmm. keen to melt away. So the, the basic idea is to make access to um, cross-border um, cooperation projects as low level as possible. And Professor Rosenthal, do universities experience this like this? Do they know from uh, about all these opportunities or is it maybe sometimes also a bit obscure where to apply for what type of uh, project funding? What is your experience? I think that the knows about the options um, they have. Um, the HRK itself is not a funding um, agency, unfortunately, maybe that will change, but so we cannot provide money for international collaboration, but of course the programs of the DFG and, and other research organizations are well known, and also on the European level. What I quite often experience and hear from, our, um, from the universities is that it's complicated to, to apply for a project um, an international approach because the money usually cannot be transferred in another country. You mentioned that you can do that to a certain extent. And we in Germany, we have a few excep exceptions and where it's possible. Ukraine, Israel is an excellent example. So I think we need more of that, that we have programs established by two countries. So we need a framework between two countries, for example, and then you can apply for funding and it should not be too bureaucratic and it should be um, only one review process and probably not two. Um, as it's sometimes the case, so one should make it easy, the threshold low, to, to, um, to, um, to support really international research by combining forces between two research, uh, research organizations of different countries. Mm -hmm. I also know that uh, DFG already has a couple of those programs uh, in line as well, so that there's already uh, a lot of possibilities. Let's uh, briefly shift to another issue, which was also mentioned uh, in the introductory talks. Uh, let's look at the geopolitical changements we've seen within the last years. Um, in Germany, for instance, uh, but also in the UK, I think all scientific collaborations with Russian institutions were stopped after Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Um, and uh, the government's new China strategy also forces researchers to think more, um, more, did, did more uh, in, in detail about with whom to cooperate and what type of project partners to choose. Um, what, according, what for your organization, where your experience with these geopolitical changes we see? So, how has it affected your doing, actually? Do you want to start, Professor Joshua? Um, yes, this is obviously a very important concern, and uh, we also applied, uh, I mean, we also have uh, uh, similar rules uh, regulating cooperation with uh, Russia, for example, and, and so on. Indeed, this is a raising concern uh, because of many reasons, and uh, we already mentioned it. It's, uh, you know, the world becomes more and more uh, well, less and less open, 
yeah. that way, which is uh, uh, obviously we need to take into uh, consideration. So indeed, we are not uh, discouraging the scientists to cooperate with um, researchers from uh, other countries, but rather we are trying to, you know, pinpoint some uh, potential risks associated with this, define this risk, and we are applying some uh, rules and regulations which might allow to lower those risks in, in the future. So I, be, I think this is the uh, uh, way what uh, our organization is uh, dealing with those problems now. That's a little bit in line with what the U European Commission also wants researchers to do. It's um, advocating value-based research partnerships where you cooperate with people who share more or less the same yes. values or mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. Is that something all the um, UKRA is um, pushing? On? And how do you do it actually? How, how do you have concrete measures to make sure that scientists stick to it? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this is obviously a huge issue um, globally, and I think uh, many nations are, are working on a as open as possible, but as secure as necessary mm. um, type framework. So it's a balancing question, um, right? Yeah. Absolutely, and then you need to support your research community to, to navigate what that means. And so we're interested in proportionate risk-based uh, measures. We have comparatively little kind of windows of, of control. Obviously, there's the point at which we issue funding and we can ask our referees to contribute to that question about um, uh, the, the risks associated with any particular project um, and the collaborators named, on, collaborators named on the project. But of course, we know that um, the moment you issue the grant is, is not the end of the story and you, it's a very global community, you meet someone at a conference and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we need to do is, is to drive up awareness in the research and innovation community more generally, shift culture to ensure that people are um, absolutely aware of the risks, that they have tools and resources available to help them to navigate those. There's a, a dedicated agency set up now in, inside the department, the just Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, that supports innovation, um, supports universities in, in assessing those risks. So a, a number of things have gone in place, but it will be a question really of culture change to support proportionate navigation of the risks whilst as we have said, all, uh, all of us capturing as far as possible the benefits of openness, which are so important, particularly in addressing those um, conflicts that we face in the first place. So really tricky for everybody. I think there really is a changing tide in how researchers are engaging with that agenda and funding agencies, but also um, governments, I think, have a really key role in helping that to reach that goal of, of as open as possible, but secure as necessary. Professor Becker, what is the DFG's approach to that? And mm. how does that fit to the international discussions at the Global Research Council, where you were also uh, chairman uh, of the Board of Governors until last year, I think, so you're familiar with all the international discussions. So um, do our um, ways of dealing with these problems, uh, with uh, geophysical changements and scientific security, are they reflected somehow on, on, on the international level? Yeah, ab absolutely. So very much in line with what Ottoline actually says, this is exactly what we are also proposing uh, from, from the side of the DFG. And, and I think we really share that with many, uh, with many science funding organizations and <clears throat> also research performing organizations. So um, there are risks, definitely, and um, I think we have been aware of the risks all the time, but we are getting more and more aware of mm. them because mm -hmm. also the geopolitical situation is changing. And we are in very close contact um, with, with all um, the relevant uh, partners here. For me, it is very important that we, that we establish um, also a European perspective uh, on this topic. Um, this will further bring together the European research area and there are already processes going, um, going on. So I think it's very important that 
the, the, the different countries within Europe come together and really sit on one table and think about these topics because that will help science and research um, uh, a lot. And of course, scientists and research organizations um, would be very grateful or, or are, uh, de depend on, of course, the information uh, from politics and uh, also from, let's say, for example, security services. But in the end, we propose that uh, the decision should be science-led mm -hmm. because um, scientists exactly know with whom they want to carry out which project and which risk there is with respect to the partner um, you know, with some input also from politics and, and security services, but particularly with respect uh, to the project. Um, so uh, so that, that, that is what, what we would propose. Mm -hmm. Let's take a, we've talked a lot about what is currently being done, what needs to be done. Let's uh, jump a little bit ahead. Let's look in the future for 10 years. So let's uh, look at the year 2035. And if we think about research cooperation 10 years from now, what is your vision? What will it look like? Brief answer, if possible. Who wants to start? Well, in well, 10, 10, years from, 10 years from now, it will be the last year of the 10, 10th framework um, in, in Europe. So I would hope that uh, we have a good budget in the next <laughs> framework. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, that we have a good mix of uh, open topic uh, research and uh, mission-driven research. Um, and third, I think um, it would be very important to strengthen certain fields like the social, the humanities and the social sciences. They do not play a prominent role right now. And I think it's very important in the future also to address our big challenges to strengthen their role in the future. There are a couple of wishes I have for the future of the framework. Okay, the next European Framework Program is supposed and to start in 2028, right? And it's now right. being prepared. And and scientists, of yeah. course, and funded let, organizations are trying to get their interests uh, incorporated there yeah. as well. Let, let me add one other point. Together with our Polish and French colleagues, we are trying to promote, promote the idea of a European Excellence Initiative, not only for um, science, but also for the private sector. And I hope that we will mm -hmm. be successful with this initiative. Professor Dame Ottolin Leiser, what is your vision for research cooperation in Europe 2035? Well, I would um, very much share your view that the transformative power of research and innovation is critically dependent on it being fully embedded across our society. Um, so it's not clever people over there doing it to you, it, it's by the people and mm. for the people. And a move really to embed much more deeply the whole research and innovation endeavor societally, I think that's, that's key. And then uh, nobody yet has said AI. <laughs> and I think it's Not very yet. difficult <laughs> to think about research and innovation in 10 years time <laughs> without thinking about the, the transformation that we are anticipating will come mm. from AI in what's possible, in how we do the work, in mm. uh, just altogether. And then, of course, we need to worry about data and compute. So I think those things will be foundational as we move forward in capturing the extraordinary benefits that I think can come um, mm. from AI in the very human context mm. of a, a societally embedded research and innovation system. Well, AI could certainly help to reduce bureaucracy, I think, but uh, of course we are looking at much more deeper uh, revolutions in, in various fields concerning that, yeah. Uh, Professor Juszwiak, what is your, your vision 10 years from now? Uh, well, I can say that I totally agree with, uh, uh, Professor Rosenthal? with uh, what you've said before. Actually, I was also going to mention the AI as a really a revolution. Yeah. Which it's a game changer, right? Uh, which which is something. Uh, on the many different levels, uh, also from the point of view of a research funding organization, it will uh, surely revolutionize the, uh, revolutionize the procedures and the, all the uh, frameworks what we are uh, applying at the moment. This is really something which is actually happen happening. We don't know yet the direction or the, you know, the uh, uh, final goal of, of uh, that, but indeed this is happening and we need to have the good uh, procedures and the, and the good strategies to uh, deal with, uh, with that. 
I believe in science. If you ask me in, gener in general, I believe in science and I believe that the science will be uh, more and more open and more and more uh, addressing uh, really uh, fundamental questions for our society. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Professor Becker, your vision 10 years from now, what do you think? Yeah, so very much along these lines, I also think science and research are absolutely essential to be able to solve or at least tackle the problems we have on this planet. Second, as Walter Rosenthal mentioned, I, I always hate talking about money, but if we want the European research area to remain competitive in the global context, if you, you know, think of all the other countries and continents coming up at the moment, then definitely this will not be possible um, without, uh, with, without budget. Um, and um, I, um, yeah, I, I, I dream of a, of a European research area in which uh, each partner has his and her place, in which we can really cooperate um, freely, openly, in which also young people can exchange freely, uh, be very mobile, and in which each partner can bring in his and her strength because many countries, you know, they have certain strengths, they have mm -hmm. infrastructures, they have particular interests in certain um, research areas, also historically, or they have certain, let's say, geographical um, um, conditions which they, they, they can also bring in. So, yeah, that, that, that would be my vision. Thank you very much, Professor Becker. <laughs> As we're approaching the end of our discussion, uh, let me try to summarize some of the key points, maybe or at least some of the things I, I take away. Well, we all agree that the European research area really relies on a strong national research system. I think that's, that's completely undoubted here. But in addition, it also needs um, bi- and multilateral cooperation schemes to uh, bring people together across borders. Um, we've also learned that there exist already many of these funding opportunities um, which are already in place and which allow universities and research organizations to benefit from sort of custom tailored funding opportunities to pursue their scientific interests. Um, and also funding schemes that can complement European funding within the framework program, basically. And we've also realized that many urging problems like um, geopolitical developments and uh, also security issues, but also the, the big global questions like climate change, biodiversity crisis can certainly only be addressed if scientists join forces and make themselves heard in all these uh, different and important organizations which, which take the decisions in Brussels or elsewhere. And it's probably wise to join forces and uh, take more joint activities in that sense. Stronger together That was the motto of our discussion, and it turns out that even it could serve as a motto for future joint undertakings in advancing science within Europe through more corporations. And I think we're all in charge to make this vision become a reality. Thank you very much to our panelists for, showing, for sharing your insights, expertise, and visions with us. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I would say, please, let's give them one final roaring applause. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.